Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to say to my colleagues and citizens watching in the gallery and online that there are people in this building today who have said that Obamacare is not our fight. That we're here in this small state legislature do not have the power to fight this type of battle. I challenge that notion. Let there be no debate about the stakes of this vote. Here's the question before us today. Is Arkansas going to be an enabler for Obamacare and the Washington, D.C. interests who seek to impose their will upon us? Or are we going to hold the line on behalf of the people of Arkansas in opposition to this dreadful law? There is little doubt in my mind that the White House, the entire Obama administration, is watching today's vote in hopes that we will be their enablers so that they can continue to force Obamacare's many costs upon the people of Arkansas. I say let's make the courageous choice on behalf of our citizens and let Washington and the rest of the country hear it loud and clear. Let's say no. The federal government cannot run without the state governments. That's what James Madison argued in the Federalist Papers. Without the laws passed by the state legislatures, our country cannot elect a president. Without this body's consent, our citizens cannot have the means to elect their next United States Senator or member of Congress. I contend that our state, through the pending question as to whether we continue the Obama Medicaid expansion, has the power to influence the future of the President's law by voting against this measure. Since the passage of the President's health care law, through the botched rollout of healthcare.gov and up to the present day, our Kansans have experienced why this law simply does not work. I know I'm not alone in having constituents contact me regarding how Obamacare has impacted them. Canceled policies, increased premiums, reduced services, and preferred doctors and hospitals that are no longer in network. This expanded Medicaid proposal puts more Arkansans into the Obamacare exchanges. It does not fix our old Medicaid system that is broken but continues to grow. It just adds a new pool of recipients and another layer of complexity to an unsustainable system. In the end, it creates competition for funding that currently goes to the aged, the blind, and the disabled. I have a responsibility to do what's right for my constituents, and protecting them from Obamacare is my priority. We must take this cause as a state, as the President has shown a reluctance to make any changes unless it was absolutely politically necessary. Just months after Medicaid expansion passed this legislature, the President announced his administration would take unilateral action to delay the employer mandate. The main reason many proponents of Medicaid expansion cited the yes vote. When one of Arkansas's own congressmen attempted to give the president legal authority to delay the mandate, the president responded with a veto threat. Then just last Monday, after committee work here at the Capitol was done, the president announced yet again another delay of the employer mandate. It was just over three weeks ago the governor went on statewide television looked into the camera and said small businesses need to be saved from, and I quote, tax imposed by Obamacare if we don't do it to the tune of about $38 million a year. Keep in mind that when the governor said that, the employer mandate was already delayed a year, therefore making that reason to pass this bill tenuous at best. Now we exist in a world where the employer mandate is delayed two years. How valid is that argument? Another talking point we've heard is the alleged $89 million in projected savings from Obamacare's Medicaid expansion that's factored into the governor's budget. The legislature has been asked to accept this as, this as fact with sketchy documentation of how the administration arrived at that number. Mr. Speaker, when members of this body asked the administration if there was a plan B, we were told that there wasn't one. I would submit to Governor Beebe that there is in fact a plan B. It is the baseline document the administration used to determine that there would be $89 million in savings derived from spending nearly a billion tax dollars. At some point in preparing the governor's budget, someone in his administration had to, at the very least, subtract one thing from another to reach their conclusion. The governor has said the $89 million figure was not high, but instead plain old arithmetic. An explosion in government spending that, sends, that leads to cost savings, that may be at the top of math that's used in Washington, but it does not pass the smell test here in Arkansas. I would remind the governor that in all the math classes I took to get an engineering degree, I had to show my work. 
I'm not saying we have to get to common core level to join our work, but I think we need more detail than a couple of line <laughs> items on something as large as uncompensated care costs for hospitals. I do not believe the proponents of this Medicaid expansion have successfully made the case to the people of Arkansas to authorize the continued spending of taxpayer dollars on it. The president himself took their main argument away from them. The governor's administration has not adequately shown their work to support its contention that spending nearly a billion dollars to save 89 million is sound policy. Because of those two key points, this debate has devolved into the administration propagating the specters of jail closings, higher education cuts, and K-12 cuts. These should sound familiar to members of this chamber, for they are the same arguments we have heard before. I contend that if we are really concerned about the prison system in this state, if we are really concerned about K-12 education, and if we are really concerned that about improving higher education, then why are we considering an Obamacare Medicaid program with a DHS budget that eventually will be more than the total corrections budget, the total K-12 budget, and the total higher education budget all combined. Mr. Speaker, my last reason for opposing this legislation is protecting the dignity of the people of Arkansas. In a speech in Boston last October to try and salvage positive headlines in the midst of healthcare.gov's failure, the president used as a talking point According to the White House transcript, he said, and I quote, Arkansas, I didn't win that either, and there was laughter, has covered almost 14% of its uninsured already, and there was applause. That's already happened, he said. He was re referencing what was passed last year, and no matter what we call it here, the fact that the president used it in that speech is confirmation that according to him, this program is, in fact, part of Obamacare. The great state of Arkansas is not a talking point. We are a sovereign state in union with others. Since the president considers this issue part of Obamacare, it follows that we have the power to affect it. Because we have the power to affect Obamacare, we must take this opportunity today. I'd rather our state force the administration to face the reality that something major needs to happen with the health care law with a no vote. Passing the funding for Medicaid expansion will make us another talking point in another speech and, more importantly, maintain the status quo while propping up a law that we can all agree is deeply flawed. The people of Arkansas, through this chamber, have the power to affect Obamacare. And if the arguments of one of our founders are not enough, then I offer the opinion of John Roberts, the Chief Justice of the United States who wrote the opinion that allowed Obamacare to remain the law of the land, but also said the Obama administration could not force Medicaid expansion in our state, and that we had the right to say no. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to address the chamber. I ask my colleagues to vote no on this bill. Representative Westerman has spoken against the bill. Does anyone wish to speak for the bill? 